morning, church. Miss Ashley here, Director of Kids Ministries here at Christian Assembly. Before we start, I pray that you are having a fantastic morning and that your week was absolutely blessed. So we have a few announcements. Here is the way, a, a few ways that you can connect um, to our church on Facebook, the website, YouTube, and the church app. Next, Wednesday night Bible study is here at the church and online at 7 p.m. Pastor David has been talking about what if following Jesus is more than just going to church. So make sure you check that out. Next, Miss Ashley's Corner. Make sure you check out Miss Ashley's Corner. If you go onto the church app, you just look for this logo and you can get all of the videos. We post about two videos a week uh, for kids, but anyone of any age can watch. Next, our food pantry ministry, Loaves and Fishes. Um, you can come here Fridays at 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. to pick up whatever food needs that you want. Um, and check it out, it's an amazing ministry. Next, different ways that you can give online. You can go to the church website, you can go onto the church app, and you can also text follow to that number on the screen. Welcome back, Sunday services. We are meeting here every Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. So if you go onto the church app, ch look for this logo and click it and you can get registered for whichever service you want to go to. Next, kids take over. We are doing another takeover for King's Kids here in the sanctuary, July 19th, second service at 11.15 a.m. It is going to be amazing. We are going to be talking about kindness, which I think everyone of every age needs to kind of brush up on being kind. So, so excited for that, and I hope that you will be there and sign up and bring your kids. Thank you so much, and here is Pastor David. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Miss Ashley. Uh, I'm, a, I'm excited as well for that kids' takeover service. It was dynamite last month, and I know it's going to be dynamite again. Make sure uh, if you have kids, why don't you come down that Sunday at 1115. Uh, I think it was uh, July 19th. Uh, it's a great, great, great service. So we're excited about that as well. It is uh, so good to be back, uh, back from vacation. Uh, so blessed. Uh, to be back and be with you here this morning as we move into July. I'm excited about a new series we're going to begin. We're going to do it throughout the summer. But I wanted to take a moment and just talk to you about prayer, uh, if I could. Uh, throughout the summer, we're going to have our hour of prayer, our, our Tuesday night hour of prayer. We, we pray from 6 to 7 p.m. And, and I just... I want to personally encourage you or invite you. Usually, we're here in the sanctuary. Uh, I don't know. There's a group anywhere from 10 to 20, usually. There's plenty of room. And if I can motivate you to do one thing this summer, uh, as we continue to move through this incredible time with COVID and the disruption and, and all that's happening in our nation and in this world, I, I know one thing the Lord would call us all to and it would be prayer, and it would be prayer together. And maybe you're somebody that's never thought about coming to prayer, but as I've thought about this uh, more and more, my heart and my prayer has been, Lord, would you grow a prayer meeting through this that would just be dynamic? Would you draw people uh, to come and pray? And so I wanted to encourage you. as we, We've turned the calendar. We're into July. We celebrated July 4th. Uh, yesterday, and it's July 4th weekend, uh, and as we move into the summer, uh, I wanted to encourage you, would you pray about, would you considering being part here in the building of our Tuesday night prayer meeting? It's really, really simple. It's an hour of prayer. I want to invite you uh, to come out to that. Secondly, uh, on that note, we picked up last month our Sunday night, once a month prayer meeting, our celebrating prayer. So in July, we're going to do that again. We, had, we were blessed uh, in, in June. But July 19th at 6.30 p.m., we'll have our celebrate in prayer meeting. We meet at 6.30. We have some simple, simple worship. Uh, we pray together. There really isn't an agenda. Uh, there's a couple of scripture verses or an idea. But uh, we come and we pray 
there had to be 40, maybe 50 people here in June. We picked it up again on the uh, Sunday night in June, which is well under our number according to the guidelines. We can have uh, upwards past 80 people and still be within the guidelines here in the sanctuary. So I also want to encourage you, Sunday, July 19th, would you come and pray? We, we have a little bit of worship. Uh, we pray. We pray corporately. Um, you know, it's more of a, a time where we say, Holy Spirit, would you lead us? Would you guide us? Uh, you know, I don't know everything that's going to happen, and I don't know everything we're supposed to do, and I don't know everything that's going to happen even as we move into the fall with the ministries here at the church. But I know one thing. Jesus said his house shall be called a house of prayer. And we're able to meet again in the building. Uh, and so I want to encourage you this summer, if you could focus on one thing that you connect with the church with. There really aren't many ministries. We meet Sunday morning. Uh, so, uh, Wednesday night has a couple more Wednesday nights that we do, you know, live here, and then we'll take a break and for the fall. But, but otherwise, there's not many ministries. There's Sunday morning happening. I, I hope you'll invest in a life-growing relationship as well. You can see all that on our church app. But what if we just started the ministry of prayer? We don't need much to do that. We just need to set a time and show up together. So I wanted to take a few moments before uh, the message this morning, before we launch into our summer series, and I wanted to talk to you about prayer, the weekly prayer meeting from 6 to 7, and then that once a month prayer meeting. In July, it's going to be the 19th. You can see it on the screen behind me uh, at 6.30. It's really informal. Uh, we don't set an ending time. We, we've been here before till 8, 8.30. People come and leave whenever they have to. Or I know every time I've been, I've been so blessed, so encouraged, so moved, and you just sense the presence of God as we gather together uh, and pray. So I'm really excited about that. I wanted to take a few moments uh, as your pastor and let you know where my heart's moving towards this summer. We can't have a ton of ministry, but my goodness, we can pray. Would you come? Would you pray? Thank you so much for even considering and praying about that. So let's dive right in. I'm really, really excited. I know I, I haven't been here uh, the last two Sundays. Pastor John did a dynamite job. I was able to watch last Sunday. If you don't know what it means to be born again, I don't know what to tell you. But both of his Sunday messages that he preached the last two Sundays in June, they're on the YouTube uh, channel. They're great messages for you uh, to look over again. But also, if you know somebody that just really wants to know, what does it really mean to be born again? I want to encourage you. Uh, to go back and check those out. Um, uh, awesome, anointed messages by Pastor John. So we're going to begin uh, a summer series entitled Somewhere Between Egypt and Israel. We're going to do this for the next couple months, July and August, eight or nine weeks. We're going to journey with the Jewish people as they literally are freed from slavery to Egypt, and they travel through the wilderness toward Israel or toward the promised land. Now, our goal is not going to be a history lesson. We're not going to look at all the facts and all the history, but our goal is to relate to their travels with our travels today as individuals and also as a church. So with that, let me begin by just reading. I want to read a few verses uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then I'm going to hone in on one verse. And then we're going to dive into our first week of uh, somewhere between Egypt and Israel. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first few verses. The Holy Spirit speaking through Paul to the church, to the Corinthian church. He says this. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. He's talking about uh, the, the Jewish people when they came out of Egypt in the wilderness. All of them were guided by that, uh, excuse me, all of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same food, spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Here's verse 5. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, 
and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Uh, That's not a happy verse to swallow. But it's verse 11 I want to hone in on. Let me take you down to verse 11. He says this, These things happen to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. I mean, powerful. He said this, talking about the the children of Israel, has God used Moses and Aaron to bring them out of Egypt? They travel through the wilderness. Uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, these things happen to them. We're going to see some things that happen to them over the summer as they're in the wilderness. These things happen to them as examples for us. It happened to them, but examples for us. And that is our goal this summer. That is our goal this July and August, to travel with the Jewish people and see again what happened to them and how it works as an example for us today. So this summer, we're going to be all summer somewhere between Egypt and Israel. And it's my prayer this morning and as we move through the summer that the Holy Spirit will speak in a powerful way to you personally and to us as a church, using God's word, using a a historic, a powerful time uh, in, in the people, the Jewish people history to speak to us today. These things happen to them as an example for us. Amen. So let me begin. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20. Here's Moses talking uh, to the Jewish people, uh, reminding them of something. Let's begin with this this morning. Deuteronomy 4.20. Remember that the Lord rescued you from the iron smelting furnace of Egypt in order to make you his very own people and his special possession, which is what you are today. So we begin this summer with a reminder. Uh, Moses said, uh, here's a reminder, a reminder that God rescued you. He rescued them from Egypt. Now, they were literally in the nation of Egypt. That's not where we are. Geographically, we're not in Egypt. But Egypt in the Old Testament, for us, it's a type of the world, the world system, the world's way, the world we live in, how it thinks, how it feels, how, how it operates. And so he said, God rescued them from Egypt a type of the world for us, in order to make them his very own people. He wanted them for his very own people. That's why God saved you. That's why God saved me. He loved you. He wanted to take you out of your Egypt, pull you out of the world, its system, its ways, its lifestyle, its behaviors. He wanted to pull you out of the world because he wanted to make you his very own son, his very own daughter. He wanted his very own people. Uh, and, and that brings purpose to life. That brings purpose to your life. God created you. He designed you in your mother's room. He created you. But, but even more than that, he's come and he's rescued you from Egypt. He's called you out of the world because he wanted to make you his very own people. He loves you. Uh, Egypt, for the nation of Israel, you know, it was a place of of slavery. It was a place of bondage, of hard work. There was pain. There was suffering. You know, so for us today, it's just that world, that world system uh, is our Egypt. And each one of us, although we live in the same world, we have our own little Egypt maybe that we lived in. But it's the reasonings and the philosophies and the beliefs and the behaviors and, and the pressures of the world, the everyday world we live in that Uh, doesn't really believe in the Lord, doesn't really believe in the Bible, doesn't really believe in Jesus. It's the whole idea, the world system is founded on the whole idea that mankind is basically good at heart and everyone's going to heaven as long as you don't do something really, really, really bad. Uh, Truth is relative, all roads lead to heaven, that's the foundation and from there the world just gives you its philosophies and its thinkings and its ways and its habits and its style and we just uh, grow up in that. Some people also say Egypt was a type of of sin, meaning that God's word, God's ways, his will, they're not respected or followed by any of the people in Egypt. And and people that tried to do that, uh, they get get persecuted for it. So Egypt, 
for the Jewish people was a, a physical place. Geographically, they were slaves to the nation of Egypt. They had to do whatever they said. For you and I, we, we're kind of, if I can quote it, slaves to the world or slaves to our sin. It's a type of the world and a sin and just the love for it and the love of it. And, and God has come and taken us from that. Now, we all battle that. We battle that now or we have battled it each and every day. The world's ways and its system and its pull in our life. The world isn't gone. It's still here. But except for Jesus, except for his finished work on the cross, um, for us, we'd still be captured in Egypt by the world and its ways, by whatever sin captured us. We'd still be captured by it. But he delivered us from our Egypt, our place of bondage and pain and suffering and sin. So I wanted to... I wanted to take a few moments at the beginning with that as, as we travel, because we begin in Egypt. So Egypt really is, it's an idea that promises much, but delivers a lot of hopelessness, a lot of anguish, addiction, suffering. And so the Israelites were there for 400 years. They were slaves uh, to Egypt. And we are all in our world where we live. It's philosophies and systems and ways. and So we begin this summer series with a fresh reminder that God has rescued you from your Egypt. I know it hasn't seemed it in the last four years, we, the last four months, excuse me. We don't really feel like we've been freed at all. Some, some of us feel like we've been captive in our own home there. But we begin, we begin with the idea, with the reminder that God has freed us from our Egypt in order to make us his very own, his special possession, which is what you are today. I wanted to remind you of that uh, this morning. God loves you. He cares for you. He wants to be with you. Uh, He has plans for you. He has a purpose for your life. So today, uh, as we begin, we leave Egypt with the Jewish people. They're called to get up and leave. Uh, It's a day God wants them to remember forever. So let me take you. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 5. Here we go. Somewhere between Egypt and Israel. So Moses said to the people. I'm in Exodus 13. So Moses said to the people, This is a day to remember forever. The day you left Egypt. I want to say that again. This is what Moses was saying to them as they were packing up and getting ready to go. He said, this is a day to remember forever. The day you left Egypt, the place of your slavery. This is an incredible day. It is an incredible thing when you understand and realize by the grace of God, you're going to be delivered uh, from Egypt. He said, today the Lord has brought you out by the, by the power of his mighty hand. And in verse 5, he goes on to say, you must celebrate this event. So I want to begin with this uh, this morning. As they're about to head out into the wilderness and head to the promised land, God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to tell the people, this is a day to remember forever. This is a day to remember and celebrate forever. Now let me say this. For you, you may not have a day where you say, I, I, I know the day. I remember the day when Jesus came into my life and here's what happened. But for other folks, maybe you don't have a day. Maybe it's a time. Uh, you remember a time in your life when this happened. Or maybe it was a season of your life when that happened. Or maybe it was a certain age. Maybe you were younger and at 13 or 14 or 18 or 20. You don't have a day, but you remember at that time, at that age, that was the day that you know you left Egypt. And, and God talked to Moses and he told him, tell the people, I want you to remember this day forever. This is a day I want you to remember forever. The day you left Egypt. You were delivered out of your place of slavery. That's what Egypt means. You know, in our slavery, really, it's the sin that we chose to live in. And God did it with a mighty hand, with his mighty hand of power, with the power, with the power excuse me, of his mighty outstretched hand. Uh, it's the day you left Egypt. Now, this is, it's the day you know 
the day you know that you know that by the grace of God, you said yes to a life of not church, not even Christianity, but it's the day or the season or the age or the time you know that you made the decision for you, no one made it for you, that you said yes to a life where you would be following Jesus. Because that's what was happening uh, at this time in Egypt. The, God, with a mighty, mighty hand, was taking, he wasn't talking to them about it anymore or just telling him there's promises, wait and see. This was the day they were going to walk out of Egypt the place of their slavery. Now, they didn't know even where they were going. So you don't have to know where you're going. But this is a day to remember. That word remember there means, a, a, that word to remember or celebrate means to commemorate. It's a day to keep. It's a day to remember. And God did it powerfully for them. They had the whole Passover to remember this season, this day, this time. We need to be able to do that in our lives. We're going to talk about that uh, as we move forward. So the best way I can explain it to you it's the day where Mark 8, 34 and 35 became real to you. It's the day where the words Jesus spoke in Mark 8, 34 and 35, they came alive to you. They became yours personally. That's the day, the season, the time he's talking about here. And here's what Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, 35. Then, calling the crowd or the people to join his disciples, Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news of the gospel, you will save it. It's the day when you, when you walked out of G Egypt, your Egypt, the place of your slavery. It's the day you personally heard the call to get up and join Jesus, to get up and follow Jesus, to be his followers. The day you said, I've got to turn from my selfish ways. I've got to turn from my way of living. I'm kind of comfortable here in Egypt. Although I'm a slave, I've learned how to live and maneuver and work with it. But there's this deep calling that I've always wanted freedom. It's the day you said, I'm going to turn from that. I'm going to turn from my own selfishness. Uh, I'm going to take up my cross. In other words, whatever it takes for me personally to follow Jesus, I believe he's going to give me the grace and the strength and the power. But whatever it takes, I'm going to take up my cross and I'm going to follow Jesus. So I'm not talking today about a day maybe you raised your hand. You know, some folks, somebody somewhere said, if you want peace and joy and contentment in your life, then you need Jesus. And if that's what you want, raise your hand. And so you raise your hand, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the day I'm talking about. That's not the day from Exodus 13. That's not what Jesus said in Mark 8. He talked about if, he, this is what he said. He said, he, let me read it again. He then calling the crowd to join his disciples. See, Jesus was sharing. His disciples were there. They were already called out. They were already following. And along with his disciples, there were crowd. There was a lot of people there. They were still in the world, and they were listening to Jesus. But they didn't have that moment, that time, where they said, this is it for me. I want to follow him. I'm going to turn from my ways, take up my cross, and follow him. There are a lot of people who, st who are still in Egypt. Listen close. There are a lot of people who are still in their Egypt. They believe Jesus is real. They believe Jesus is a great prophet, a great prophet of God. But they want Jesus to join them in Egypt to help them live a better life in Egypt. That's the difference this morning. They're saying, Jesus, would you come into Egypt? I, I kind of like it here, but there's things I'd, I'd like you to come and change. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the day or the time or the season when you got delivered from your place of, uh, your place of sla slavery, your Egypt, from his, with his mighty hand and his outstretched arm and his power. He came and said, no, you're going to leave Egypt and you're going to come follow me for the rest of your life. You've been called to leave Egypt.
you're not supposed to live in Egypt. You weren't made to live in Egypt. You weren't made to live in this world. It's ways, it's system, it's beliefs. Uh, you were made to follow Jesus. Uh, and so God has brought you out of Egypt with power and a mighty hand. He rescued you. So that's where we begin with this summer. I want to remind you, in the, in the midst of maybe the most turbulent time our nation has ever gone through, that you have a calling on your life. Do not slip back into the ways of the world. Do not say, you know what? It's been so upside down. I'm going to drift back to the way I used to think, the way I used to live, the, the, the way I used to believe, the kind of the Egypt, what I'm comfortable with, what I know, what I know the best, what I'm most secure with. This following Jesus has gotten a mysterious. Don't turn back. You have been called out of Egypt to follow him. Just cling to him. We're going to talk about that all summer, all summer. I don't know where we are, but I know we're somewhere between Egypt and Israel, the promised land. We're not in the world anymore, we're, but we're traveling, you and I, Christians that are following Jesus. We're going somewhere. We're traveling. We're following. We may not know exactly where we're going, but we know who we're following. We know in the end where he's taking us to the promised land. I want to encourage you with that, to come out from the world. You're not part of Egypt anymore. The great temptation when things get hard, when pressure builds, when we become anxious, when we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, the great temptation, and we're going to see the, the Jewish people had it as well, is to go back to Egypt, to go back to that way of thinking and living and feeling and being. And I want to tell you tonight, no, you have been called. Jesus said to all the people, if you want to come join my disciples, if you want to come turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, follow me. He said, because if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. And that's the greatest temptation of Egypt, to say, you know what? Things have gotten upside down real fast in so many places, in so many ways, on so many levels. I'm going to begin to try to save my life. Don't do it. Still give your life to Jesus. You'll lose it. If you follow him, if you give your life to him, I guarantee you he'll save it. He died on the cross for you. It'll be worth it. 2 Corinthians 6 talks about what it means for us to come out of Egypt. For Israel, it was real easy. For the, for the Jewish people, it was real easy. They physically walked out of uh, the, the nation of Egypt. Geographically, they walked out. You may not be moving anywhere. So what does it look like for you and I to come out of our Egypt? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. Again, Paul is talking to Christians, the church there, and he gives great insight to this. Here's what he says. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I'm in 2 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers. Here it is. Come out of your Egypt. Come out from among unbelievers and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. This is our call. This is our Exodus 13 to come out of Egypt. So let me talk to you about this for a minute. Because the way we, the way we come out from among them, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, the way we do that is by setting boundaries. Not physical boundaries. We don't get up and physically move. We don't geographically say, I cannot be in the vicinity of people that are not believers. That's not what this means for us at all. We're not all supposed to go up into the mountains and separate ourselves. Of course not. And in John, John 16 and 17, Jesus said, you know, he's sending as God, the Father sent him in the world, he's, he's sending us. He wants us to not come out from the world, but be protected from the evil that's in the world. So that's not what it means here. When, when Paul said in Corinthians, and the Holy Spirit says to us, when he says, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. What it means for us is we set boundaries, but, but they're not physical distances. Uh, the boundary is in your worldview. The boundary is 
what you believe, what I believe, the way we live, how we respond to life. That's the boundary. We don't think like the world anymore. We don't make decisions like the world. Our worldview becomes from God's Word. Uh, his, his principles, His commands, His teaching, they guide us and lead us. Uh, the way He responded, we want to respond. That's how we're different. We want to live in a way according to the Scripture. In other words, I can give you a Scripture verse. In other words, this is how we come out from among them. This is how we live separate from our Egypt, from the world around us. Galatians 5, 22 and 26 says it best. Here it is. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, this is what the Holy Spirit will do. And this is what will separate me and you from the world we live in. It will separate you from the person you may work two feet away from, but you'll be so separate in this way. As we take a look at Galatians 5, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. We begin to love like Jesus loved. Joy, peace, a peace that passes understanding, not the peace the world can give. Jesus gives a different peace. Love and joy and peace, patience. Love is patience. Uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. From the inside out, God wants to change you. He wants to change me. So this is how we become separate separate from the world. Uh, what begins to come out of your mouth and your heart and your life are things of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's a huge one. Then it's, it continues. Let me finish. There is no law against these things. Nobody can stop you from allowing the Holy Spirit to transform your nature, to transform your character, to come out from among them, to be separate from the world. Nobody can stop you from be growing in, in love and in joy and in peace and in patience, the fruit of the Spirit. There's no law against it. He goes on to say, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature. The sinful nature is, that's where our our Egypt, our place of slavery, that's where it got its strength from. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Now watch. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. The part I've underlined here in Galatians 5, is, is the pinnacle difference once God has said, I want you. And by His grace, you've said, yes, Lord, I'm coming. I'm going to get up. I'm going to walk out of Egypt, my place of slavery, by your grace, by your power. I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to turn from my ways. What ways? Well, it says it's here. Let us not become conceited, provoke one another, jealous of one another. Those ways, the ways of selfishness, the ways we learn from the world. Uh, we come out from among them. Since we are living by the Spirit, that's the greatest difference for you and I. That's what makes us different. That's how we come out from among them and separate ourselves. You can be at a restaurant sitting right near people that are living in the world, but you are so separate because you're living by the Spirit. You're at work. You're at home. You're living your life. But what's different is you're living by the Spirit. Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. That's the difference. That's what calls you to come out from among them. It's not a geographical thing, uh, but it's an inside. It's an internal thing. It's a spirit thing where the Holy Spirit comes in and transforms your character, transforms your person. And all of a sudden, there's this different person walking around. It's the same body. You're the same age. But all of a sudden, there's this person that's living by the Spirit. What does that mean? They're living in love. They're responding in joy, peace, patience, kindness. They're saying, forgive me. Uh, they're beginning to open God's Word and read and pray and see the whole world differently. That's what makes us different. That's what uh, that call is in our life. Since we are living by the Spirit, 
Because the Holy Spirit doesn't go into the world and live in the world. As a matter of fact, Jesus said the world isn't even looking for the Holy Spirit. It doesn't even recognize Him because He's not looking for Him. I believe Jesus was teaching His disciples that in John 14, 15, 16. But He said, you know Him. You know the Holy Spirit. That's what makes it different. That's what makes you different. That's how you are begin to separate yourself. You begin to live a righteous life. Not perfect. Uh, in humility, you begin to live righteous. You begin to, you begin to live moral. And the words you say and the, the, the things you think and the reasonings and your actions and your attitude, the Spirit of God is causing you to come out from among them. And it's making a difference. And you're becoming a great light. And many people are loving it, but you'll also get some persecution with that. Um, so powerful. So powerful uh, this morning as we begin somewhere between Egypt and Israel. Uh, be reminded this morning that you've been called out of Egypt. And I know Egypt has been rearing its head in the last four months, my goodness. But that's not your call. You're still separate because you're living by the Spirit. And in living by the Spirit, you're following the Spirit's leading in every part of your life. That made all the difference in my life. When I came out of Egypt, when I got saved and begun to follow Jesus, what made all the difference was I was a school teacher at the time, a second grade school teacher. I stayed a second grade school teacher. I still went and taught. I was with all the same people, but I was so separate from them because I was following the Holy Spirit day by day. I was letting Him lead in every part of my life. I wasn't perfect, far from it, but the Spirit was leading and guiding me. The time when I said, Lord... I'm not asking you to come into Egypt anymore. I clearly hear you call me to come out and be separate and follow you no matter what it takes. I'm no longer going to try to save my life. That's what God said to the, the Jewish people on that day. That's what God spoke through Moses. He said, I want you to tell the people this is a day to remember forever. I am going to walk them out of Egypt, their place of slavery. I'm going to take them out with power because I have the power to do it. But I want you to tell them as they begin to move out and travel, never forget this day. So we begin. We begin summer 2020. The first step is one we are to remember forever. As a matter of fact, we're to celebrate, to commemorate the day God brought us out of Egypt with his powerful right hand by the blood of Jesus, by his grace and mercy and love. It's a day to remember forever that season of your life, that, that age you were at, that time of your life, or maybe it is a specific day. It's a day to remember forever. The day your eternal life changed, you were set free. You knew it. You heard the call. This is my day. I'm leaving Egypt. I'm not looking back. If you haven't had that day, make today that day. Maybe you've been playing church, playing with God, sitting on the fence, not sure about all this. Maybe you've been on the edge of Egypt, just talking to Jesus, checking it out. You're looking out into the wilderness and you're not sure what's out there. You can trust Him. Make this your day. Make this your day. Say, Jesus, this is my day. I want to turn. Forgive me of my sins. I want to take up my cross. Would you help me? I'm not even sure what that means. I want to follow you. You may not even know exactly what that means, but you know the Spirit of God is on you and saying, this is your day. I remember hearing that call so clear in my life. It wasn't verbal, but in my heart and even in my mind and in my soul, I knew that time, that season of my life when God was saying, this is why you're here. This is your purpose, to come and follow me. You have to learn, though, to celebrate. Learn to commemorate. We haven't had a lot to celebrate in the last few months. But you can take this summer and celebrate, commemorate that time, that day, that season. The day everything changed forever. And again, it may not be a day. It may be a season, a time in your life. It may be an age you were at when you knew, I'm following Jesus now. Don't let it become a small thing. Don't think for a minute. That's for new Christians. That's for new believers to get excited, to commemorate or remember or reflect and meditate on that day, to praise and thank God for it. Don't think that that's for new Christians to do. Be excited about it yourself. That's what, that's what God told Moses. And we're going to find out next week 
really how important it is. It's more than just to celebrate, but it's a day that recenters us, refocuses us. And I don't know if you've ever done that. I don't know if you've said, I, I don't remember much of that. It was some time back, and maybe for you it's a, it's a decade. I don't know what it might be because you don't think about it much anymore. We're so far past that in our journey. But God was sure to tell Moses to tell the people, if you go back and read, this is how Passover began. He said, you're going to have Passover every year because you are going to remember every year how I brought you out with power from this world. You're not part of the world no matter what you're going through because the world is going to try to drag you back. We're going to see over the summer. You know, Egypt keeps calling to you. It may lose its power, but its voice is there calling you to come back, lying to you, telling you it wasn't slavery. It was good. Come on back. You were safe, but you know you weren't, and I know you're not going to do that. Um, Don't ever get over the day. Don't ever get over the time. Don't ever get over the event when you said yes wholeheartedly. And more than saying yes, you actually repented, humbled your heart, cried out for Jesus to forgive you and rescue you, and he did. He said, come, follow me. It's time to leave Egypt now. I didn't make you for Egypt. I didn't make you for a fallen, broken world. Uh, You're mine, and we're going to begin a journey through a wilderness, and we're going somewhere, and we're going somewhere to the promised land. And you know, next week, we're going to see the absolute importance of keeping this day, of commemorating it, of celebrating it, uh, keeping it alive, because it's it's part of your testimony. It's part of your story. It's the part most people need to hear. How'd you get out of Egypt? They may see you now and say, I could never be like you. What they need to know from you, how did you ever get out? It's so important. We're going to talk a lot about that next week. Uh, Let me take you back to where we began. I'm closing here this morning. It's July 5th. Exodus 13, 3 through 5. So Moses said to the people, this is a day to remember forever. The day, the time, the season the age you left Egypt. Have you left yet? If you have, have you remembered? Have you commemorated it? The place of your slavery, the place where the devil in this world, they just were just caught in lies, misery. Today the Lord has brought you out by the power of his mighty hand. Let me remind you and humble you as I'm humbled. You didn't get out, and I didn't get out because we figured anything out. We figured nothing out. It was the powerful hand, the mercy and love and the passion of God. And it was sealed by the blood that Jesus said on Calvary. You don't ever have to go back. You must celebrate this event. Commemorate it. I want to close this morning with a simple testimony uh, before I pray. Uh, we, we began this summer with coming out of Egypt. So we're going to be somewhere between Egypt and Israel all summer. And Moses was real clear. God was real clear to tell Moses to tell the people, do something to commemorate this, celebrate, remember this. It's important. It centers you. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that next week. But I want to close with a testimony. It's, today is July 5th, uh, 2000. 20. Ten years ago, July 4th, it wasn't the 5th, it was the 4th, was a Sunday. Ten years ago, July 4th, was a Sunday. 2010, July 4th. I have a picture behind me. I want you to take a look at that picture uh, as you see it up there. That picture was taken July 4th, 2010, a decade ago, ten years ago. You can see me in the picture. I was young. Uh, I was good looking then. Uh, you can see my wife there. She's still good looking. Uh, Don and Darla Balot, if you know them. And there's Chuck and Jimmy. Uh, God, God bless Chuck. He's passed since I've been here. What a mighty man of God uh, uh, he was. Uh, you can see his wife, Sherry, there. And you can see Rebecca. And you can see my kids. The only one you can't see next to Chuck uh, is, is Hannah there. This was taken the day 
I was uh, voted in as pastor of Christian Assembly. This is my 10-year, my family's 10-year anniversary. It's to be commemorated. It's to be celebrated. And um, I'm reminded this morning, I have in front of me a little envelope. It's, It's tattered. It's torn. It's got tape on it. Inside this envelope are 89 pieces of paper. They're the votes. It says on the outside, July 4th, 2010, votes to elect Pastor David McIntosh as senior pastor. The votes are in here. I didn't take them out and count them this week. I think there were, I don't know, 89 votes. Uh, I think there were 88 yes and one person abstained. This was 10 years ago. Moses, Moses said, tell the people to remember this day. There are days and times and seasons of your life you need to remember and commemorate because, they, because they're part of who you are in Jesus. Uh, I love this picture. I, I have these uh, cards. You can see I get emotional uh, talking about it. Um, it's been a great 10 years. I, I feel like I just started. We got uh, 10, 20 more years maybe to go. But I keep these, and I have this picture because I remember, I celebrate, I, I, it, it centers me back. It reminds me of that day and that time and the call. I was called here. I knew God called me here before the vote, and the vote, God just moves through the people. And they said yes. Um, and, and as we read this morning, tell the people to remember this day forever, to commemorate it. I don't know if you need to write it down Write your story. Uh, We have something on our church app to do that. Your story, the day or time you gave your life to Jesus. I want to remind you to do that. But I remember, I commemorate this day. I remember this picture. I remember these cards. I remember the vote. I remember what I did that Sunday, getting on my knees uh, up there uh, on the pulpit. I, I can tell you what I preached. I remember I've been reflecting, you know, these days and been reminded and been recentered back of just the call uh, on my life here, to be here in this time, this place. It's powerful to do that. You need to do that in your life. This may be a great summer to get re. This may be a, a great July 4th weekend, a great July 2020 for you to say, hey, I'm going to take some time and remember and reflect. Maybe you need to go back and read the scriptures or remember that day or that time or that season. Write it down. Take a time praying and thanking God for it, whether it was a year ago or a hundred years ago, because it reminds us, it centers us, it brings us back to the call. I have a purpose. I've left Egypt by his power, and I'm following until he calls me home. I, we're going somewhere. We're going to the promised land. We don't know when we're going to get there. We're getting close. But all summer, we're going to be somewhere between Egypt and Israel. We begin by God powerfully in his word telling us, listen, I've called you out. You come out from among them. You remember this day forever. It is such a part of who you are and your story. And I want you to be blessed by it. I want to use it to move and work and recenter you. But I also want it to be part of your testimony so you can tell other people how to get out of their Egypt. Pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We love you tonight. We bless you. Uh, We thank you. We bless you. This Sunday, this July 5th, we thank you for this country. Lord, our country needs help. But this morning, we thank you for Jesus, for the call, for the power. You didn't just call. You had the power to take each and every one of us out of Egypt. Would you help us? commemorate, remember, celebrate, Lord. Would you prepare us? Would you continue to show us how we come out from among this world and we're, we're just separate by being spirit-filled and spirit-led uh, in our lives? Lord, I pray for anybody watching, anybody hearing my voice, anybody that's seeing this, if they've struggled with their Egypt, their sin, their slavery, and maybe they believe in Jesus, they come to church, but they know they haven't had that moment, that time where you said to them, this is the day I'm calling you out. I need you to repent. I need you to turn from your selfish ways, repent, take up your cross. I'm calling you to follow me. I'm giving you the power right now. 
I'm giving you the grace right now. Declare with your mouth what you want to do and believe it in your heart. And, and by the grace of God the Father, through the Son and the power of the Spirit, I'll call you out of Egypt. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life and the rest of your life will have massive purpose. May that be your day today. And if that's been your day, I know for so many of you, commemorate, celebrate, remember, hold on to it. Thank God. Bless God. Go back to that time. And let it recenter you again this morning. He loves you so much. He's got such a purpose for your life. You are so going somewhere. And when we get there, oh, it'll be so worth it. It'll be so worth it. So worth it when we get there. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Fourth of July, Independence Day. Enjoy, celebrate, be safe, and we'll talk soon. Amen.